Hello, I'm George Potter. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. It's been a fun interview with George Potter, and it's been fun to learn more about the frankincense trail that Lehigh likely followed in the Middle East. In our next conversation, I'll ask George where he thinks Lehigh and Nephi landed after they left the frankincense trail. George thinks it was probably the Andes Mountains of South America. We'll learn more about that in just a minute. Before we go on, I just want to mention that if you'll uh, subscribe for just $10 a month, you can get a copy of this transcript and all future transcripts as soon as they are released. So please subscribe today. Now back to our conversation. Where did they go after, after Karori? Well, that's probably another time, okay? <laughs> um, uh, I'll have, you know, one in time, six months, I'm going to have to, we'll schedule our next interview. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. But as a humorous aside, I was, I was once, when I was just here for like a couple of weeks, somebody called me up and said, would you like to host a, uh, a group? Um, we have this uh, cruise ship down in the Caribbean, and they're going to um, the Book of Mormon lands in, in um, Yucatan. And they... Their, their host is sick, and so they, somebody recommended you would be a very interested candidate. And I said, I, I, I could never do that, you know. Why not? Well, I don't believe they went to Mesoamerica. That doesn't make any sense. There's never a Nephite civilization existed at the Book of Mormon times in Mesoamerica. It's just, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. And that ruined their vacation. And then the, the host said, well, would you like to do a, a cruise with us sometime, uh, the, this agency? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I've never been up through the, uh, um, the Baltic countries or the North Sea. I mean, that'd be kind of a nice cruise to go on if you want me to do a cruise for you sometime. And then the lady said, well, what's that got to do with Lehigh's trail? And I said, if you give me a free cruise, I'll guarantee you Lehigh went there. My theory is, is that the Book of Mormon took place in the Andes Mountains of Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, parts of Chile. Um, why? Well, I was a missionary in Bolivia and Peru, so naturally that's where it took place. But actually, um, if you look at the archaeology that's been discovered in the last 15 years, the, there was a civilization, there were civilizations, I should say, that took place in the Andes Mountains that had most of the attributes of the Book of Mormon uh, in them, in the Book of Mormon times. Um, if you go north of Panama in Book of Mormon times, there was nothing that resembled the Jaredites. The Maya ruins, most of those classic ruins, are, took place well after the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is written on golden plates. There was no gold in north of Panama, anywhere in the Americas, before 7800 A.D. There were no sheep, no horses, no animals you could refer to as the animals of the Book of Mormon described by Nephi. But if you go into Peru and you look at it from a linguistic standpoint, all the kind of animals that are described in the Book of Mormon existed in Peru in Book of Mormon times. Maybe not as what you think a horse would be. Like, what's a hippopotamus? It's a water horse, because they didn't have any other word for it. What is that kind of looking animal? Well, it's kind of like a horse, but it lives in the water. We'll call it a water horse. Well, it's not a horse at all. Well, when the Spanish got to Peru, they, they looked at the alpacas and they said, these sheep are beautiful. The wool's better than the wool of our sheep. They taste better than our sheep. They had no idea that the alpaca is actually a cameloid. You know, it's like, and, and what did the, what did the um, Incas think of the horses? They're big alpacas. They called them big alpacas. So what did Nephi would have called an alpaca? He probably would have called it, I mean, a llama. He would have called the llama a horse, okay? Anything with a tooth was described as an elephant by the Greeks. That was the language of Nephi's time. Nephi never saw an elephant, right? But there were boars in, in South America that had, had tusk. Anything that had tusk was an elephant. The Book of Mormon describes the fact that they went into the wilderness and they found gold and silver and copper in abundance. Heaven's sakes, in Potosi, Bolivia, they've taken out much silver. 
to build a, a rod all the way from Potosi to Spain and back. I mean, the, when the, the Spanish got there, they went to the homes of the poor people and there's gold just sitting there. The doors were unlocked, there's so much gold, you know, it was, it was just amazed, you know, and that's what gave, made the Spanish so greedy when they got there. They found gold plates, gold plates in, in Peru that date back to 1900 BC. Jaredites had gold plates, okay. You know, when you look at even the Jaredites, the earliest civilizations in Mesoamerica, honestly, the early, oldest civilizations, the Olmecs, what do they go back to? They found little villages where there were maybe little grains of corn they found or something like that. No, no major civilizations, just little villages. 1300 BC. I'm sorry, the Jaredites were here in the third millennium BC. Where were the Jaredites? Well, if you go to Corral in Peru, you'll find Jarats, ziggurats, excuse me, these pyramids look just like the ones in Mesopotamia. You find, um, you know, huge cities dating back to 12, what, 2700 BC. These are Jaredite cities. They didn't exist in north of Panama. So, if, if you look at all the different attributes of a Nephite civilization, I mean, seriously look at it. Then seriously look at carbon dating, what the archaeologists have found, you'll find that you have a very strong candidacy for the Book of Mormon lands being in the Andes, but not north of, of Panama. Now, are the people north of Panama Lamanites? Well, certainly to a great degree. Do you think the people just sat around Peru doing nothing? They were trading all over the place. They were wandering. They even talked about Jaredite migrations. The people of the old world, they were not, you know, isolated. They traded with each other. Just like in the Polynesian islands, they would trade daughters between the islands as gifts, you know, in terms of trade. You know, we got too many daughters, let's go sail to an island and we'll trade her for something else. <laughs> so they speak the same language throughout the Polynesians because of the daughters that they traded. And, and there's pretty good evidence we that the seen. Peruvians are traveling through the Polynesian islands as well because they have the sweet potato, they have other things there. So I believe that if you look at you know DNA, which gets diluted very quickly, by the way, you'll find that uh, all the people in North South America have some blood of Lehi in them, some DNA. Okay, so that, that actually was one of the questions I wanted to ask you because, uh, so I've, I've already talked with uh, Dr. Hugo Perego about, and he's kind of mm -hmm. said what you said, that it gets diluted very quickly. I've, I've also talked with Simon Southerton. Um, I should be publishing that soon. Mm -hmm. um, and he's of the opposite opinion. Oh, you know, there's no Lamanite DNA in any, or Jewish DNA, I guess I should say, in any of the Americas, North or South America. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're you're leaning more towards the Perego position that it just gets diluted too fast and that's why we can't see it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. It gets it, it, you need to kind of look at my a chapter in my book Nephi in the Promised Land, where I talk about the fact you know there was a small group of four brothers that landed in Peru. There were already people living there. We know. People were living in South America back as far as 10,000 BC. Some even date 40,000 BC in in Argentina. There are people living there. They, when they showed up, the four brothers, okay, and 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 the local people, you know, talked about the four brothers who came to them, and and the the fourth, the youngest brother, was a kind person who became their king, who taught them how to do everything, you know, right. The oldest brother was very violent. So they're, they're, they're already landing in an area where they are a very small subset of a, of a large population. And, and so if you look at the oral traditions of Peru, you see that there was a small elite group who ruled anciently in Peru. And they spoke their own language. Um, when they built a temple, they would not allow the locals to, to build it. Only they could build the temple. You know, and, and, and so over time, even even them, and, and you look at people like uh, Moroni who says, I'm a pure Nephite. 
Well, what's that mean? You're not Heinz 57? You're not part Hawaiian and part Alaskan and part African? Like, like America today. You know, people mingle. They fall in love. They marry each other. The Lamanites, I mean, my gosh, they come there with these Hebrew mothers who must be very rigorous, and in one generation, they've gone native. I mean, Nephi took his sisters with him, right? So who, who, who did Laman and Lemuel marry? They married local girls who didn't have that same culture, didn't, didn't cleanliness. They the Adron Ishmael, married. The daughters of Ishmael? Didn't they, they, they did, but they must have married other ones as well. Because if you look at it, they go from being this very, we call, I guess for the time, very sophisticated, hygienic culture to being filthy. Nephi describes them as being loathsome. I mean, you know, how do they do that in one generation unless they've gone sort of native? They've, they've intermarried into a native population. And their kids are, you know, most of them probably are natives. And some are non-natives, you know, or a mixture. Mm -hmm. So you, you put that in the context. Within a short, very short period of time, you're going to find no DNA or very scant traces of any kind of Hebrew DNA in them. Not European, but Hebrew DNA. Right. You know, it's... I, I read the book by uh, Stephen Jones. It's called In the Blood. It's very interesting because he talks about the LDS. You know, he's a British general. Uh, um, anyway, he talks about the fact that you know when when the like when they went to Yemen and they took all the Jews from Yemen and they brought them to Israel and they are all practicing Judaism and the whole works, and they found out they didn't have any Jewish DNA at all. It was all Hebrew DNA, I mean, all Arabic DNA. Okay. Okay, and, and not, not a trace of, of it, but originally they were settled by Jews. You know, they, there was a Jewish colony down there, but over time, intermarried with the dominant or more the larger population set, and, and the DNA just gets diluted away. And so it's mostly and it kind of shows DNA. that, yeah. Same with the Jews from Spain who went to Turkey. You look you at their DNA, it's all Turkish DNA, but these are Jewish communities. Because over time, you know, they married Abdullah, you know, instead, yeah. <laughs> instead of Joseph. <laughs> so, and I know Simon has said, uh, you know, his, I guess his rebuttal to that is, well, let's look at the Lemba tribe in Africa. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with the Lemba tribe? Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. So they're a black African tribe that have mm -hmm. Jewish... Hebrew DNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and. So I didn't use them as an example. Yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't support my theory. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you know, we have to be careful about cherry picking the science, too, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so it, it does seem logical, at least to me, that if we can look at this black African tribe and say they've got Jewish DNA, why, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't that translate to Peru or. Or, you know, in Central America, you know, uh, Sorensen's theory or Rosenthal's theory with the Baja okay. theory or, or something well, like that. Well, I'll tell you what I, my thoughts are on that. You go to Altiplano today in, in Bolivia and Peru, in Altiplano. There are like 150 archaeological sites there. Very few have ever been touched. They believe that up to a half a million people, and this is, this is archaeologists, once lived on the Altiplano, maybe through climatic change or whatever, um, you know, the population dwindled and they moved lower down the mountains, the Andes or whatever. But when, when four brothers show up in, in the Andes, how, how large was the local population in comparison? Probably in the millions, tens of millions. So what kind of impact on the DNA are you going to have? Well, what about with the Lemba tribe? And then they get they get killed off, and the pure ones, the pure Nephites, they're murdered, they're killed, mm -hmm. right? Well, so, I mean, the, uh, and, and of course, how, how large was the Lemba tribe that came to, to South South Africa? I don't, I don't, don't know, you know, how isolated they were, what the community structure were. Um, I'm surprised they have that that DNA, but I, again. It all depends on, on the dynamics of the situation. The, the Nephites, the, probably the bulk of the Nephites, who would consider themselves pure Nephites, were killed. They were killed off. So there went 
a part of that. And I, I don't believe they're all killed off, by the way. So, well, the and the other problem, have, the other problem you have, too. yeah, the other problem you have with South American DNA, unless you go out into the jungles, in in the Amazon, it's very far, very difficult, from my understanding, to find any kind of pure Indian blood. Okay, that even the tribes that are in like the the small towns, you think the Indian villages in the Andes, they've been influenced by the Spanish bloodlines. So it's it's it's, it's another problem you have with tracing the DNA down there. So it's it's hard to find it where there has been a mixing of it. Okay. Because you go from pure Indian to Cholito, which is the mix, this Mestizo, which is more Spanish, to the Spanish. Very few Spanish down there now. Okay. Okay. But the Mestizo and the Cholo is a mixed bloodline and with the Spanish. And then they keep mixing with each other. So I, I really can't, you know, I'm not a DNA specialist. I'm not going to go into that. But that's my, my reading. Okay. Okay, and I think you'll find that with the demise of the, the Nephite civilization, those who called themselves pure Nephites, because Moroni made it very clear he was a pure Nephite. Well, what's, <laughs> what's his cousin then, you know? Is he something different? And, and if they were killed off, and then you have just a small family moving into an area that had a large population. And I think there's a lot of evidence in the Book of Mormon you know, Nephite says, well, Nephi writes, or I guess maybe it's Jacob, he says, and all those, you know, he, he separated from his brothers and all those who would follow me. And all, all and Jacob says, all Nephite's friends. Who are Nephite's friends? Nephi's friends. He's, he's taken with him his sisters. He's taken Sam. He's taken... Um, Zoram. Zoram, excuse me. <laughs> okay, he's taken Zoram. He says, a long time since I read the book. He's taken Zorb, and then he's taken all those who would, who would b believe in him. Who are they? Well, he's converting people. He's, these are natives. And then you have, who's the character that comes in, you know, uh, Jacob's sitting there, and all of a sudden this guy comes in, Zizram or something. Like, mm -hmm. He speaks the language of our people. Who the heck's Zizram? It's got to be cousin Zizram, right? It, it sounds like some stranger just wanders in and knows their religion knows their language. There had to have been a big native population down there. You know, there's a few places maybe in the Americas that were pretty isolated, but most of the Americas were populated at that time mm -hmm. with large populations. So to make sense, if you want to really make sense from an archaeological standpoint or anthropological standpoint, you got to consider them to be with the isolation theory that they're just a small group within a large group. And even the church changed the forward to the Book of Mormon now saying that, you know, the... Um, Instead of the principal, they're among the ancestors. They're among, yeah, some of the ancestors of, yeah. the, of the today's American, Native right. Americans. So I think it just makes, makes sense. But again, um, if you look at all the characteristics that are described of a Nephite civilization, all the sophistication that they had, the fine linens they had, the silks that they had. You know, silk just means anything that was woven. It doesn't mean something that came from a worm. It's an Arabic word, silk, okay? Mm -hmm. This comes through Arabic, okay? To, to the Book of Mormon. Just anybody, yeah, the, the, the people in Peru could make fantastic tapestries and, and sophisticated clothes. And the clothes they wore looked like the Greeks, just like, even, even you take something as, as simple as What's the numeric system that was used by the Hebrews? It was based on decimal system of 10. Right. Okay? They don't just change to 12 when they get to the New World, like they did in Yucatan. The, the Peruvians used 10. Oh. Those above North you know, Peru, they used either 8 or 12. Okay? You don't just change the way you count. <laughs> Oh, back to the way they dried meat, you know, the Lord. I told you, I tell you what kind of surprising thing I found. I'm going across Oman one time. And I come into to Korori, mm -hmm. and, there, and there's a town right next to it called Taka, ancient town there. 
And I'm seeing that the people are laying out their meat in the sun and they're spicing it. Okay, they're making jerky out of raw meat. Okay. Right there in town. I mean, oh gosh, that's interesting. Where Nephi says they're eating their, their meat raw. I don't know if they had jerky up in, in Palestine or Israel. But here they are down in Oman making basically jerky. They lay it out there with spices. Okay, they spice it and, and they're making raw meat. I took photographs of it. Then I find out that jerky is actually a Peruvian word. That jerky was, was made in Peru. Hmm. So we say jerky, it's a Quechua word. It was a Peruvian word. Jerky. Okay. Hmm. So where, so where did the Peruvians learn how to make jerky? Maybe from Oman. And through the Lord showed Nephi how to make the meat sweet. And with the spices, it with was With the kind spices, of the sweet. preserving it, yeah. Okay. In, in the sun, preserving it. Raw, hmm. but edible. I don't know. It's just, it's just fun. Fun yeah. stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking so much time with me. Um, so I think I am going to have to schedule an interview in six months. And we'll talk a little bit more about your uh, Peruvian theory because we we spent well, a lot of we time got we got the Jaredites and we have uh, Peru yeah. and um, a lot of other things. We'll right. get into Islam sometime. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Well, great. Well, thank been a you. Pleasure for uh, for talking with here, talking with me here on Gospel Tangents. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with George Potter, and I'd like to thank George for spending so much time talking with us. Now, in our next conversation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Simon Southerton. He's got a bit different take on the Book of Mormon than George, and also, you'll probably remember last summer, we released a transcript with Dr. Ugo Perego, an Italian researcher. We're continuing our world tour. We're all over the world now. So Dr. Simon Southerton has a bit different take on DNA in the Book of Mormon, and we'll learn more about Simon and, so and Ugo's different takes on DNA in the Book of Mormon. I don't think it's correct to say that my interpretation of the science is much different to Ugo. Oh, um, really? Ugo uh, and I agree on the fact that they haven't found Lehite DNA, and that's certainly correct. Um, no, as far as I'm aware, in the literature, and I've searched the literature fairly extensively, and. They haven't identified any Middle Eastern DNA, uh, certainly that arrived prior to Columbus, in Native Americans. So on that point, we largely agree. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, there, it sounds like there's still some, some different interpretations going on, and I, and I really want to get into that in just a second. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on facebook.com slash gospeltangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at youtube.com slash gospeltangents. We're also on Twitter, at Gospel Tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.